Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. From the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. We are live from New York. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Apple CEO Tim Cook visits China and undines its importance to the tech company. We'll discuss the future U.S.-China relations and supply chains. Plus, we'll look at what's behind Tesla's post-election stock surge. Is it fundamentals or is it hype? And Bitcoin's rally stalls out after nearly reaching $100,000. We'll discuss with Kristen Smith from Blockchain Association. But first, let's get a little bit more on today's market moves. When you fold in the geopolitical contentions here. We're still eyeing what happens between US and China. We still try to digest what's happened in terms of earnings from the Chinese tech giants. Isabel Lee joins us now. And Isabel, you've really been going global for us. And I want to take a moment to say how awful Chinese earnings have been for the big tech companies. And we get a little bit of a reprieve in trading today. But we were entering a bear market at the end of last week. Definitely. It was definitely underwhelming for all of the Chinese tech companies. And it's not a surprise to allude to the geopolitical and economic uncertainties and whether or not these companies can win investors back largely hinges on Beijing's stimulus splits. And that has really since fizzled out. Just over the past week, we have the five biggest tech companies erase $41 billion in market cap. The MSCI China index slid to its lowest in September. And call after call, a lot of these executives are really just saying how uneven the economy is and how underwhelming their business is and how most offered cautious optimism, but they also ask investors for patience. We have PDD, for example. They walked around discussing their disappointing earnings. Tencent then had promised new blockbusters. Even Baidu, which was the front runner in the AI development, failed to wow. And adding to this is, of course, a Donald Trump win and what that would mean for China. And lastly, we have Morgan Stanley cutting Chinese equities to slight underweight and Goldman mm. Sachs lowering its MSCI Chinese gauge um, rating. So it really underscores how cautious and how shaky. Chinese equities are on for now. Isabel Lee with the roundup of concerns with China. Meanwhile, look, amid that economic concern are a number of top executives of global firms traveling to China, participating in discussions with the country's premier. Apple CEO Tim Cook was one of the most notable names. Just to take a listen to what he's had to say. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm so proud that Apple has an exhibit here with our partners. So how do you value your partners in China? Oh, I value them very highly. We could not do what we do without them. Dana Wallman's with us, joining us for more on, well, remind us why China's so integral to Apple. China is um, a huge, hugely important to Apple's supply chain, and um, according to our reporting, it is Apple's second largest market behind the U.S., um, where it is currently um, struggling, according to many of our reports over this past year, against um, domestic uh, Chinese domestic smartphone makers. Um, so on those two counts, extremely important to Apple. Meanwhile, they've got to try and front run what other tariffs look like, what tit for tat of the future and under a Trump administration can look like. And actually, you've done great reporting across the entire team that they have interesting relations across Asia more broadly, somewhere they have to invest more to earn the right to sell their products, and China where they have to earn the right to continue to build so much there. Absolutely. And a real study of contrast today, Bloomberg also had a report out that Indonesia is really pushing back on lifting its iPhone 16 sales ban, um, really demanding more investment from Apple, saying, hey, you have um, invested so much in manufacturing in Vietnam, which is um, a smaller market for you in terms of iPhone sales. Why not um, invest more in Indonesia, which is the largest um, Southeast, Southeast Asian economy? Um, so the two stories today stood as a real contrast for me. Um, this push from um, Indonesian leaders versus um, just this report out of China that really highlighted how vulnerable Apple's business is in the region. Dana, we love the context. Dana Woman for all things Apple. Look, let's talk about the other juggernaut that is NVIDIA, a big exposure to China too, of course, in terms of selling into that market. The CEO, Jensen Wang, was just in Hong Kong over the weekend, where he received an honorary doctorate in engineering from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He emphasized NVIDIA's ties to the region and weighed in on the potential impact of the incoming US administration. Just take a listen. I don't know what's going to happen uh, with the new administration, but whatever happens, uh, our, we'll, we'll balance uh, simultaneously 
uh, compliance with, with uh, laws and policies, uh, continue to advance our technology and support and uh, serve customers uh, all over the world. We'll continue to do that, and we'll be able to do that just fine. Let's keep this conversation going from an investor perspective. Scott Ladner, CEO of Horizon Investments. Does it give you pause as you try to understand what on earth US-China relations look like next year and how it impacts your investments in tech? Um, yeah, look, it, it has to. You, I mean, you have to take account of what this administration says they're going to do to China, um, especially on the tech front, and and what and, and frankly, what China's retaliation might look like. You know, we we think actually the U.S. is probably a little bit of a stronger position than they were in 2018, the last time they, these two powers really confronted, um, because China is frankly in the throes of a balance sheet recession right now, so they probably don't have quite as much maneuverability on the um, on the stimulus side. Uh, but but at the end of the day, you know, like taking account of how these two are going to interact uh, amongst each other, kind of a lot to do with where we put our money. In tech. Okay, so would you ever, even at these pretty beaten up levels, be thinking about the Chinese technology giant still being an area to be accretive in the future? Look, fool me once, fool me twice on, on the Chinese stimulus stuff. It, it's not, you know, we, you can't you can't predict what the, what the Chinese administration or the Chinese uh, Communist Party is going to do with respect to, to fiscal stimulus, which is really what the doctor ordered for, for that economy. And without that fiscal stimulus, it's really tough to get out of these balance sheet recessions where demand is just lacking. Um, and, and so, you know, if we do get signs, we, not, not signs, we get announcements. Um, that, that China is going to engage in large-scale fiscal stimulus, then yes, you have to get on board the Chinese tech stocks because you know, they, they, you know, then the consumer can come back alive again in China um, and we can really get, get going. But without that, it's, you, just, you can't predict uh, policy in China, so we, you know, we just have to take a wait-and-see approach. What about U.S. names that have significant exposure to China and perhaps haven't managed to show that they've got such strong demand globally that it doesn't matter? It, you know, it's, it's going to hurt them. Um, you know, and, and it, but this is not, you know, this is not new news. I mean, everybody knows with the, with the Trump win um, that China is going to be sort of enemy list number one. And so, and so you know, that the, these these companies have been planning for a while uh, for the for the potentiality of a, of a Trump win. They're going to have answers to it. Uh, but you know, just just because you know, this is you know, like I said earlier, this is not new news. Well, let's think about what's not new news when it comes to a player like Nvidia. Currently, Nvidia is one the worst points contributor to the Nasdaq today. We're falling significantly another 3%, which is a lot of market cap erosion for a business as big as this. Is that more about just profit taking? Is that about exposure to China? Is it about exposure to too few clients like Microsoft, like Amazon, and like Alphabet? <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's probably a little bit of all of those things, Caroline. It's, it's um, you know, when you when you have one of your largest clients, uh, you know, a company like Amazon coming out and saying, uh, look, we might start competing with you. Uh, we're, we might get in this game, even though they've been, they, they've been in the game for a while, but now they're really ramping up efforts. Um, you know, this is obviously a very lucrative space, you know, margins of 75, 80 percent on businesses like this. So, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense for, for other large tech companies to come in to, to come in and try to challenge uh, NVIDIA's place in the market. These things will take some time. Um, but, but, you know, those, those things have to weigh on the, on the stock price at some point. So what do you do, Scott? Do you keep the exposure you'd have? Do you, it feels a fool's errand to have a bet against big tech in some way. Oh, I, I, and, but let me be clear. I'm not. I'm not advocating in any way to bet against. They bet against big tech. I mean, you know, we are. We are in the in the mid to late 90s sort of cycle. AI is him, as my kids would say. Um, you know, the, you know. So this this is this is definitely a train you got to get on. But it's a train like that, that that you have to get on in a broadening sense. You know, this is not just Nvidia anymore. This is not the 2023 AI trade. Uh, just, so you know, the the broadening out of this theme into other users. Like, how are companies going to use? Uh, AI in the future. You know what other what other you know suppliers are going to come online, like like possibly Amazon in the chip space. So you know playing that broadening out theme inside of AI is frankly we're spending quite a lot of time trying to figure that out here at Horizon, and and it's something that I think a lot of investors are going to have to. But it is you know no, you do not want to be short tech. You do not want to be short these AI, this AI theme. Uh, this is something to get on board. But you have to understand how to play it for 2025, not for 2023. I know you don't want to share the secret sauce, but as you're doing that work, where have been the rich pickings so far? We've heard often it's about the energy play or it's about the applications within healthcare, but where have you found some of the outsized potential here? Yeah, you're you're picking on a couple of them. Hey, look, I mean, you know, at some point you got to get down to the users. So you know, if, you know, if you think about how the, you know, the tech trade played out in the mid to late '90s, you know, at first it was the people that made the tech and made things possible. But really, you know, the the, the main gains were, were to be had by people that use the technology, that use the internet, that use PCs in order to enhance productivity in their businesses. So you know that you know getting onto that getting onto that type of play is where we're spending quite a lot of time trying to figure out like you know what you know you mentioned healthcare 
you know, which biotech companies are going to figure this out in order to do advanced drug development? You know, which which major pharmas are going to figure this out in, in, for for the same type type of reason? You know, what kind of industrial companies are going to figure out logistics improvements uh, based based on some AI uh, logic that they're building in their processes? And so th those types of questions are the things we're trying to answer right now. You know, I do think we're second or third inning of this stuff. It's probably a little early to get really on board with the users, um, but it is you know you have to start doing the work right now. Keep coming on when you've done the work. And as you continue down, it's Scott Ladner, he's CIO of Horizon Investments. We really appreciate your time today. Meanwhile, coming up, we've got so much more on some of the stocks that have outperformed. Tesla, for example, absolutely mean like stock surge. Is it leaving Wall Street feeling a bit wary at these levels? We'll bring you the details from the latest UBS note as we're up another 4% over the last five days. Let's just focus in on one of... Well, a key driver in the market today is Tesla. We want to look at it over the last month. Shares, as you see, up 31% in the last month because, well, of course, all surrounding the new administration that's likely to come in 2025. UBS analysts are cautioning that this post-election surge is more to do with market exuberance than actual improvements in the fundamentals of the business. Who knows, Craig Trudell has more. And we've been trying to understand, crucially, whether this relationship, personal one, really, between... Elon Musk and Trump and the future administration will bear dividends for the business of Tesla. And you've been trying to measure it up, so has UBS. Yeah, I, I think uh, UBS's report is very interesting today because they, they will sort of grant this idea that narrative-wise it makes a lot of sense that you would see a run-up in the stock given how close Elon Musk has placed himself to Donald Trump. Uh, but they really sort of pick apart some of the reasons, you know, uh, commonly cited for this run-up in, in the last few weeks. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at uh, taking away EV tax credits in the U.S., for example. Um, maybe Tesla is able to, to handle that better than some of its competitors that aren't making money on EVs. But it's still not a positive for EV demand uh, as a whole. And so uh, UBS is a bit uh, bearish on that front. And yeah. when you look at aut autonomous vehicle policy as well, you don't have an actual robo taxi uh, at Tesla, whereas you know Waymo is out with a robo taxi now, and uh, you know that was that company was just valued at about 45 billion. So does it really make sense to put you know potentially hundreds of billions of dollars on a, a Tesla uh, autonomous vehicle valuation, given its its sort of closest comp Waymo is valued at much less than that? The problem is. The price target for the next 12 months, on average, from the analysts that rate it, is well below where we're currently trading, 244, whereas the last price is currently 354. We've seen relative strength indexes of Tesla just show that we are overbought territory, and yet we don't seem to be able to actually bet against the stock. Yeah, I think that's another point that UBS makes uh, interestingly today is just that we've seen this before. We've seen that this is sort of an ultimate momentum stock, that mm. when it rises, it really rises. When it falls, it really falls. Uh, and I guess that's sort of befitting of, of Musk, right? He doesn't do anything halfway, but you really see in terms of, uh, you know, uh, equities that uh, are, are commonly, uh, you know, traded with, with options that, you know, really sort of lead to these outsized moves. I think Tesla is, you know, sort of exhibit A in terms of, of stocks that, you know, because of the options activity, uh, you tend to see, you know, sustained and, and really dramatic moves in the stock one way or, or the other when you have a, a sort of uh, reason for the stock to, uh, you know, narrative wise, you know, go, go in one direction or the next. We'll see whether the meme trading can continue. We're currently <laughs> up on the day, at least. Craig Trudell, always great to check in with you. Meanwhile, let's take a look at Rocket Lab shares. Absolutely surging as well after the satellite company said it successfully launched its 56th electron missile. Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn joins us now. We're up 3%. There's other narratives around the business today in terms of the Chips Act. But focus on this launch. We had one out of New Zealand very swiftly after one out of the United States. Yes, so there are two launches. Uh, the launch in the United States uh, is for a customer that uh, the uh, Rocket Lab has not yet disclosed. Uh, in the past, Rocket Lab has done launches from Virginia for U.S. government customers. Uh, the launch in New Zealand was for a French startup. This was uh, um, part of a multiple launch contract that Rocket Lab has with them. So altogether, the, this makes 14 launches that Rocket Lab has had this year. Uh, which beats their record, which was 10 last year. Uh, let's put this in context. Um, uh, 
impressive for Rocket Lab, but yeah. remember that SpaceX has had more than 100 launches this year. They are very much still an also ran at the moment, but they're clearly garnering some momentum here. What's interesting is they're also getting money from the US government when it comes to chips. Where else in the manufacturing area are they and why are they getting such money from the Commerce Department? Uh, so this is, uh, this is the final signing of uh, a bit, uh, contract from the Department of Commerce related to the CHIPS Act, uh, $23.9 million. Uh, the company had announced a preliminary deal for this before, so this is not a surprise. Mm. People knew this was coming. Uh, uh, Rocket Lab has a subsidiary in New Mexico that makes uh, solar cells. It's one of the only companies, I believe there are only two in the United States, uh, that make these components. Uh, and uh, so Rocket Lab has now gotten funding from the Commerce Department to promote that, to build, to build more of those. So just giving another lift to this stock. Uh, interesting what you were talking about with Craig earlier about in, in optimism about post-election. Uh, Rocket Lab is one company among several space companies also benefiting from this uh, bullishness uh, after uh, uh, Trump's re-election that uh, the new administration will have policies that will be favorable to the sector. Almost 12 billion dollars market capitalization, not quite up to the 250 billion dollar market valuation we understand for the privately held SpaceX at the moment. Bruce Einhorn, brilliant to get the context. The French government is offering to buy the advanced computing assets from Atos for as much as $653 million after an earlier offer from the state expired. Now, the offer includes the company's AI business as well as its supercomputers. Bloomberg's Benoit Bertolo is here with more. And what, what is better about this deal, or is it just different? Because this is all about trying to bail out what is a company that's under a lot of duress from a debt perspective. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's important for Atos at, at this stage to to divest it has its activities. Um, the creditors who are taking over the company will win liquidity out of it, and and most importantly, the French state has wanted to ensure that these strategic assets remain uh, within French control and are sort of safe. Uh, these are important um, assets because the supercomputers we're talking about are used to do. Uh, the, the simulations of nuclear um, uh, activities, for example, that are very key to France and, and the French government. Uh, so this deal is sort of narrower. It's just on the supercomputers uh, part of, of Atos, uh, mm. which is called Bull SA. Uh, and, and this leaves on the sides other assets um, that are in cybersecurity, uh, what's called mission critical systems. So these assets are going to be sort of up for auctions and other French companies, again, are going to make uh, bids for these activities. So that's the kicker here. These all want to remain in local hands in some way. Some deals have worked. World Grid Unit was sold to a French engineering company, but others have unraveled, like the one with Thales. Is, is it just trying to find the right price point here? Yes, there, there's a bit of that. The creditors want a good price point for it. Um, the, the French uh, defense companies uh, bidding for these assets will certainly want to have a good price as well. We know that Thales, uh, uh, an important French defense company, is interested by what's called mission critical assets uh, here. They said in the past they could be interested. They have not bid, made a bid yet. It was probably complicated for these companies to, to do a deal with the French state. So now the state has done the deal on the supercomputers and and other deal could be done. But you're right, what's at stake here is really the strategic assets and the sovereignty of, of uh, French technology that's critical for the civilian industry and also for a lot of military use. So while this company has been unraveling, it's really the stake of these really sovereign assets uh, that's at stake now. Meanwhile, it's bonds trading at but cents on the euro. Significant pressure there still. Benoit Bartolo on that key French asset. We thank you very much. Meanwhile, time for Talking Tech now. First up, online verification company ID.me disclosed a tender offer that valued the business at $1.8 billion, according to a source. Ribbit Capital, a new investor in the company, led the transaction, with existing investors, Viking Global Investors and Capital G participating. Plus, Insta360, it's a Chinese rival to GoPro, with backers including IDG Capital, is considering an IPO in Hong Kong 
after plans for a listing in mainland China stalled, according to sources who say the company could seek a valuation of at least $2.1 billion in a share sale. And Sony is in the early stages of developing a portable console that would play its PlayStation 5 games on the move. It's according to sources who paid, say that the product is meant to expand Sony's reach and go head-to-head -head with Nintendo in the portable gaming market. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Yet more news around companies buying it, adding to the balance sheet, MicroStrategy, one of them. Let's get to it with Kristen Smith, CEO of the Blockchain Association, who can really discuss the future more broadly of how we're going to be thinking about where we go in terms of overseeing of Bitcoin and crypto more generally, how we're going to see more laws made. Of course, we've had the news that the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, has announced that he's going to be stepping down from his seat come January. So, Kristen, were you surprised by the news that he's front-running any ousting? Uh, no, I wasn't surprised by the news. It's very common when there is a change of power for the chair of the SEC to step down um, at the end of the, the Congress and the end of the presidential term before the inauguration. And so, um, you know, we're certainly very excited to see him leave. Um, it has been a, a really difficult uh, couple of years for the industry. We felt like we've been boxed in the corner with his regulation by enforcement approach. But right now we're really focused on trying to figure out uh, you know, how can we move forward as an industry? How can we reset our relationship with government? And we're very excited to get new people into these key positions and work with the uh, newly elected Congress when they come to power next year. Because I think we have a real opportunity to get a regulatory framework in place uh, that will that will be, be lasting and appropriate for the industry for, for decades to come. Okay, can you talk to us about the names, for example, the the SEC are currently pondering, Farley Champ, for example. These are sort of names that you think won't be regulation by enforcement. Yeah, and I think that there are a couple of great names that have been floating around for the chair of the SEC. I think from the uh, standpoint of the Blockchain Association and the industry, what we want to see is somebody in there who has experience and deep understanding of crypto. I think there are going to be many challenges that the SEC chair faces, but Figuring out the right regulatory environment for digital assets is going to be one of those things. And so we don't care who it is as long as it is somebody who has a deep understanding and who's willing to have an open dialogue with the industry. There's been a discussion about having the first ever crypto post in the White House. Is that necessary at this moment when you have a relatively pro-Congress, more pro-crypto than we've ever seen before, and indeed a new SEC chair? I, I think it would certainly be a welcome position. I mean, uh, make, make no mistake, what we needed was a strong Treasury Secretary pick, and I think we got that with Scott Besant. Uh, we also need strong choices for the SEC and the CFTC, because without those three positions, a crypto czar isn't going to be able to get much done. But if you look at the many different issues, and this is something that we touched on our letter to President Trump uh, on last week, they cross many different agencies, right? We need to deal with the debanking issues with the Prudential Bank regulators. We need to deal with the market regulatory issues with the SEC and the CFTC. We need Congress to step in and pass a new law. And I think having a crypto czar position at the White House would help facilitate those conversations and make sure that we're getting all the pieces done. Because there are a lot of different, different parts that need to be addressed. They occur across many different agencies. And so, so, yes, we would welcome someone in that role, but not at the expense of getting somebody strong in at the SEC and the CFTC. Okay, so if it's not a mutually exclusive thing, who would you want to see as a czar level? How deep within active duty do you want them to be or do you want them to be perhaps a step removed in terms of advisory? Well, I think there are really two qualifications you want from that role. One is you want somebody who understands the crypto industry. It is very nuanced. There are a lot of different pieces and you need somebody who can understand and navigate the people and the personalities of the industry. Um, I also think though you need somebody that knows how to navigate government because if you have someone who shows up from industry but doesn't understand the nuances and the history of the relationships, um, you know, it, it would be difficult. And so I think that's going to be a very tough uh, position to find. Um, but I think there are a lot of people in the industry that are willing to step up uh, and step in and do that kind of role. For people who aren't day-to-day -day working in crypto, can you explain to them why they would want to see an SEC chair so deeply in the weeds of understanding crypto when the SEC also has to oversee 
the trillions in passive investment, the understanding of implications of AI on, on ETF investment, and ultimately when crypto remains well, about the same size as NVIDIA's market cap? Yeah, well, I think that this is something... Uh, a, a you're getting someone who can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? I think if you look at crypto, yes, it's it's uh, you know just approaching a three trillion dollar market cap, but but this is still the early days. This is going to be the foundation of financial services, of our internet, of so many things going forward that we really want to get the regulatory framework right now for when this is a 10, 20, 30 trillion dollar asset class. And so I think that it's really important that, that we get the rules right so that consumers feel protected, so that institutions feel comfort to come in, but also so that the developers, the builders of the underlying blockchains and the applications on top of the blockchains, they understand the rules of the road so they can do it right here in the US. Um, I think this is gonna be a big part of our economy in the future. And if we don't get the rules right now, we're gonna miss out on that here in the United States. Have you been asked, Kristen, for the czar role? Pardon? Have you been asked at all about the czar role? Um, I, I've spoken to some people about it, not for me, but um, I've, I've offered up uh, some ideas um, as to what kind of qualifications would be good. Kristen Smith, thank you for the transparency. It's great to have you on again, CEO of the Blockchain Association. Meanwhile, let's talk about other government versus tech. Google and the U.S. government really facing it off in federal court today as each side are delivering its closing arguments in the case on the tech giant's alleged monopoly of online advertising. Adam Epstein's here with us. He's co-CEO of the search advertising company Ad Marketplace, been advising the DOJ antitrust team on the remedies. In this case, and this is sprawling. At the moment, everyone's front of mind for Alphabet and Google is the fact that they might have to sell off Chrome. Right. Now, Many would say, okay, it's about dominance in search. Many people worry also about dominance in advertising, and that's something that Europe's been looking at too. Just tell us what role you've played for the U.S. government. Sure. So, you know, I've been in search for 20 years. I went to the closing arguments back in May. The uh, decision came out in, in August, and I wrote a memo talking about how there could be behavioral remedies mm. that could fix the, uh, the, the search and the advertising, search advertising markets. Uh, the DOJ saw the memos, asked me to you know, speak with them a few times about what we're doing, and then you've seen in their uh, proposed final judgment and order, some of the ideas are in there, as well as some of the ideas around Chrome divestiture, Android divestiture. Some of that's around making sure that, that Google would comply with the behavioral remedies. Um, and so this is a $200 billion market, and it's been a monopoly, it's been running for a while, so getting the remedy right is difficult, and then making sure that there's compliance will be the next step. Your business is in the world of placing advertising, but not having to depend just purely on a few key dominant forces in search. Right. Would some of the things being discussed at the moment, some of the remedies, dramatic as they are, help your benef and benefit your business? Sure. You know, there's, I think, a lot of folks that would be able to invest in this, in this industry. It's been, I think, Satya Nadella at Microsoft called it a no-fly zone for investment for about 20 years. So we've been, you know, working where we can around the edges to help uh, browsers and large shopping apps uh, create native search experiences. And we think that is the future. And obviously, we have a, uh, a little bit of a head start, but there will be a lot of uh, entrance in this space, both from the advertising side and on the, on the search results side, especially around AI, uh, next-gen uh, search agents. That's really the future. And that's, that's kind of the irony of the whole situation. Many feel actually Google's never been under such competitive threat than they are now, particularly when it comes to us perhaps donning Google Search to one and instead using ChatGPT. Right. You might also, though, be using AI overviews and a Gemini offering. Just from your perspective, selling off a Chrome... Can you see anyone in the market actually buying that apart from an open AI, for example? Sure. I think there's other folks that would be interested in, in buying Chrome. It's the largest browser in the world. I, I think what the DOJ's uh, initial proposed uh, re remedy really set off was the first shot of Browser War 3.0. Okay. So I think you'll see other browsers, uh, you know, the DuckDuckGo's and the Firefox of the world, the Braves. Those folks will be uh, more to the front, forefront. There'll be new browsers coming out, perhaps uh, really built around Gen AI. And the, the idea there is that, you know, if we have a lot of entry points and we're still able to have some Google monetization, some Google results side by side, that's going to be the best uh, and most innovative experience for users and searchers. It's not that it's an all or nothing. Either you get Google and you've got to take Gemini or you can use something else that's a little bit more innovative or, or trying something different. The idea that we all go to the search engine result page of Google and basically get a one-size-fits-all solution, that's, I think, what the real, you know, 
detriment is to, to consumers and to users of the search monopoly we have currently in place. But the problem is, it's very expensive for the infrastructure build around an offering such as Search and Google Chrome as an access point to search. Would anyone ever be able to offer such a great product for consumers right. without the huge deep pockets that a Google has? Exactly. So half the clicks that Google uh, sells now to advertisers start on third-party sites like Apple, like Samsung. Uh, the question is, can, can they get access to Google's results into their ads and then curate their own experiences with perhaps instead of Gemini, uh, a chat GPT search agent or with other ads or with other results or ranking and changing how the rankings work. That's really what we're talking about is allowing for that innovation to take, to take hold, not forcing, you know, force funneling every user to search result page of Google in order to take advantage of Google's assets. So the idea is I think it's both. It's not an either or situation. And that would be the, the remedy that I think gets us into a more innovative uh, uh, space and also brings competition to the market, which is at the end of the day what the goal is. Well, we're going to be waiting for the final <laughs> round of what exactly is going to be offered and indeed then an appeal process. But in the meantime, Adam, it's been great having you here from a perspective of the ad marketplace. It's co CEO there, Adam Epstein. Meanwhile, coming up, some major fundraising news for cybersecurity firm Halcyon. The company's CEO, John Miller, joins us next. This is Bloom Technology. Today's VC Spotlight, we're talking about the explosive growth in ransomware. And we're looking at what a cybersecurity firm, Halcyon, is doing to stop those attacks and how it plans to invest its newest round of funding. Here with more is Halcyon CEO, John Miller, who's just announced, announcing a $100 million raise. It's your Series C. Congratulations, John. And I want to understand, when you yourself now have a $1 billion valuation, put that into context of how much each year cut bad actors are making from ransomware. Oh, I, it's a small, small fraction, right? We've seen the growth of ransomware year over year explode in the last five years. Um, you know, the the losses that corporations are seeing are on the, the scale of tens to hundreds of billions of dollars a year right now. Um, the scary thing is we're the only actual, or at least the first anti-ransomware company to ever exist where we took ransomware as the mission of our company mm -hmm. to try to figure out how to mitigate as much risk for our customers as possible. Okay, so that's fascinating for our viewers who are trying to understand how you block suddenly your, your corporate being overtaken and everything demanding that you give them some crypto payment immediately. What is it that your technology is different? So what we're all about is breaking that leverage that they get to actually incent someone to pay them. Right. So it normally goes down into kind of two forms of extortion. One is they'll come in and encrypt everyone's data, uh, effectively breaking the computers. Right. And then they'll demand extortion to get the encryption keys back to bring all the data back. And then the double extortion, as it, it's called, is when they steal data from outside of the, the enterprise and then charge you to not release it. And so at Halcyon, what we do is um, we've figured out how they exfiltrate or steal that data and we stop it when it starts to get stolen. And we, when they go to encrypt the systems, we stop them. And if they successfully encrypt something, we capture the encryption keys and we have the ability to just decrypt everything. How? Any way you can explain the underlying of what it is you're doing? Yeah. I, I mean, it's all super technical, right? We, um, the best way to think of it is like a new type of focused antivirus. Instead of antivirus being wide against all types of kind of malware and spyware and adware, we're just focused on ransomware. And so because of that, we every day we follow the different groups, we take apart their tools, we take apart their samples. We're just completely focused on this threat and it's giving us increased efficacy over everybody else that's trying to, to do like general security for everything. It was our theory that ransomware had become such a big problem that by actually focusing on it alone would give you higher efficacy and the ability to, to mitigate more risk than the more generalized solutions that exist. But at the moment, we, are, we had Palo Alto Network CEO on last week, for example, and there's a shift between, towards what he says is platformization. People wanting not just loads and loads of different vendors, but wanting a one-stop shop to protect them. Would you end up folding in your offerings to other cyber 
players out there. What is your end goal here when you've now raised a, a good chunk of change from some key yeah. partners? So, so we integrate with all of those players, the Palo Altos, the Cisco's, the Dell's. Um, really, we are kind of our own platform, right? So we're building ourselves to, to not just have a feature um, that, you know, gets integrated into something bigger, mm. but a platform specifically around mitigating the risk of these ransomware threats, right? As these attackers continue to, to get more money and be more successful, it just gives them better access. They get better tools. There's more of them. So we're starting to, I, I mean, and I think it's obvious, we're starting to lose the war against these attackers. And by coming in, we're, we're going to use this money to just try to bring as much value as we can to, to our customers about stopping these ransomware attacks. John Miller, $100 million Series C. We thank you from Halcyon. Amazon getting ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NVIDIA in the AI hardware space. Though that won't happen anytime soon. The cloud computing giant is hoping to reduce its reliance on the chip maker. Bloomberg's Matt Day is here for more. The toe-to-toe -to -toe quote comes from a very key executive within Amazon who's trying to take on NVIDIA in the training and inference space. Tell us about it. Yeah, that's right. That was from James Hamilton, the godfather of Amazon Web Services hardware strategy. About a decade ago, he suggested to Jeff Bezos that they get started making chips, and we're seeing some of the fruits of that now. You know, they weren't necessarily planning on the AI boom to unfold as it is, but you know, it just so happens they're on their third generation of AI chip, and they think they've got a part, as they'd call it, that can uh, compete with NVIDIA. Why is third generation so important? And why, therefore, are they going all out and handing $4 billion to Anthropic again to be able to get them to use these chips ever more? Yeah, so the third generation is kind of the prove-it point in chips. You know, your first is an experiment, your second sort of starts to, uh, to catch on, and the third, if you did it right, is probably going to be the one that gets you the volume and the success that, uh, or else you go a different direction. Um, this is definitely uh, helps explain why Amazon is doing things like spending all that money on Anthropic, as you said, um, investing in them and investing in other partners who will help them use their chips, help them improve Amazon's home-built chips and build a, a better mousetrap to compete more effectively with NVIDIA. NVIDIA is down a lot today. Uh, 3%, it's, it's a big move in terms of market cap because it's of course got a massive market cap. But at what point would we see less dependence on an NVIDIA from an Amazon? What is their end goal here, that they no longer have to buy them at all? Or is it more that they just supplement and aren't quite so dependent? I think it's definitely to supplement it. You know, Amazon's pretty sober about this. They're, they're not trying to remove all of the NVIDIA from their data centers far from it, and that would be a miracle if they could pull that off. You know, I think the, the goal, um, if they were even optimistic, would be that they can create a credible rival to NVIDIA. They can put a lot of those in their own data centers. And then you know, for the customers of theirs who want to use NVIDIA, that's still around, but that they've got a, a competitive offering uh, as well. And just remind us, I mean, Alphabet's been at this a long time. Microsoft are just getting in the space. Yeah, Amazon's got company. Well, as you said, Google's been doing this for about a decade. Um, Microsoft just now is rolling out its first chips, but it seems that everyone in the cloud has come to sort of the same realization that they need to build the hardware, too, and they need to build the most sophisticated hardware, which is the chips. Matt Day, it is a great piece. Today's Bloomberg Big Take. Go read it. An excellent deep dive. Meanwhile, we've got plenty more news on Amazon, because that came out on Friday that they're really trying to help their clients understand quantum computing. It's the next iteration of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And boy, is it helping some quantum computing stocks. Look at this on the day. We're currently seeing Rigetti up 71%. We're up 28% on quantum computing, as they're saying Amazon's offering advisory help, as well as, of course, the future of where hardware goes when it comes to using quantum computing for its clients. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. You do not want to forget to check out our podcast. Find more on the terminal, as well as online, on Apple, on Spotify and iHeart. This is Bloomberg Technology.